All right, everybody. Thanks for attending. Uh, thanks for joining us, watching later on uh, for June's focus discussion this year. Uh, obviously, the theme is uh, refereeing with personality. So what we are covering tonight is refereeing uh, and a coach's perspective on it. Uh, and you might know I'm not much of a coach, but uh, we brought in a guest instructor tonight who's one of those rare AYSO national uh, referees and national coaches. Uh, and I'll let her do more of her intro on her decades of, of coaching. Uh, but without, without any more ado, here is Cindy Elliott. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Liz. We're not going to do that. <laughs> Um, so what I want to do this evening is talk about, put you in the mindset of a coach instead of the mindset of a referee, and uh, hopefully that will give you some insights that will help you work together uh, to make a better game for the kids. So that, that's our objective to talk this through. Um, so how many of you are also coaches? I may have coached a few games yeah. in my past. He's done, well, this is done one game. I, Keith was... So how about you, Miller? Much coaching? Yes. Uh, yeah, high school, 13 years. Okay, very good. So he's got some insight as well. You coached a little bit yourself, didn't you? So what I wanted to do to start off with is get you guys to tell me, describe a coach. Tell me about a coach. What's the coach thinking, doing, describing the coach when he shows up at the game? Wants to have a good experience for his kids. Wants them to feel like uh, like it's going to be a, a fun time and a and a uh, uh, you know uh, w wants the kids to to f feel like they're part of a part of a team and um, you know have have sport have have that kind of team experience, you know, where they, they get to be part of a group, contribute. Okay. Brings the uh, players together to uh, perform their best during game. Yeah. No small part, wants to win the game. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I was going to say, wants to win. Would like win. to win, would like to win. I, I would describe mm -hmm. them in three words. <laughs> Positive, instructional, and encouraging. <laughs> well, let's get to real life. <laughs> you know, a good experience for the kids covers a lot mm -hmm. because I want, I, I mean, as a coach, for me, I want the kids to be happy, um, uh, you know, that they get to play a game. So I really want that, that kind of good, positive experience, which is, you know, Lewis said, but I want them to be able to learn something in the game about, about, um, you know, uh, what works and what doesn't work. So uh, I guess I would say tactics and, and strategy and, and kind of be able to take away, as a coach, I want to take away some things we can talk about and practice and work on. Okay. So, um, you know, see see what we talked about during the week, if that worked. And then, yeah, takeaways, I guess, uh, to, to to help, help uh, build their knowledge and their skill. Okay, good. So... Thank you for sharing that with us, Keith. So these are some of the things that, that I noted that I thought are important um, to, for a referee to understand. This is what goes through my mind, what I observe in other coaches during the game. They're human. They have their own opinions, biases, and weaknesses. And I think it's important to remember that. And they're, they're entitled to be human. And we need to acknowledge that be aware of that. Um, they want players to be safe. For me, I think that's my number one concern and the thing that I've seen make games go south with respect to the coach really badly is when the coach feels their players aren't safe. Either rightly or wrongly, but they feel their players aren't safe. Um, they want a fair game. And yeah, they want to win. Some more deeply than others. Coaches are skeptical. They want you to show them that you're going to give them what they want. They don't just come in, don't assume that you're qualified and you're competent. 
they're going to be skeptical. They need to experience it. They need to see what you have to offer. Um, and they will point out referee mistakes. They're used to pointing out the player's mistakes. They're used to being the leader. So they'll point out the referee's mistakes. They're an influencer. They can influence the parents. They can influence the players. Um, they're the boss at practice, but they're powerless during a game. And this can often be the source of a lot of frustration for a coach. Suppose you have some of the earlier items I mentioned um, become a concern for them. How do they get power? They're used to being in charge. And now somebody else is in charge. So they have to trust that what their concerns are are the same concerns. And they have to figure out how to communicate with the referee who's in charge during the game. So we're going to talk a lot about that relationship and how we can make the coach feel comfortable. Um, and also I want to point out, they may have knowledge of laws of the game, but they may not. And that's one thing we can't, we as referees assume the coaches understand the laws. And in many cases they do, but in some cases they don't. And so that can be a, a source of, great, of frustration. So what I'd like you to do is keep all these things in mind when you see the coach on the field next time. They've got all these things going on. And, and like Keith said, they, they've worked on the tactics at, at practice, and now they want to see it applied. Okay? They want some takeaways. Yeah, they want to win. They want their players to perform, and they want a good experience for the kids. But they're kind of skeptical, so we have to make them feel comfortable. So we have to build a relationship. And uh, I'm going to kind of go over some key points but we're going to talk about how you create that relationship and then how we're going to build it. Um, to create the relationship, it starts with a greeting, evolves into the player check-in, and that's when we're all building relationships. Not only with the players, but with the coaches especially. And the coach <coughs> is assessing the referee during those first experiences. I gain a lot of opinions. I form a lot of opinions about the referee team during that greeting and the player check-in. That's when I make my uh, judgments of, okay, how this is going to go and, and what I expect from that. So you got to consider that as a referee, that's when the coach is really judging you and seeing if they can feel comfortable with you or not. Making them feel comfortable is very important. And then we're going to be able to build the relationship with the coach. Um, some key points I want to touch on are persistent offenses, use of advantage, how we can handle player management, particularly with the coach, how we can have conversations with the coach, um, passing lanes and the frustration with that. And that has to go with Keith's point here. They may have some tactics and the coach knows what he wants to play out. Okay? And, um, Opportunities like fouls in front of the bench, and you can build that relationship. Anything else you guys see, think of that you could say adds to the relationship as well? Uh, per persistent offense, but early recognition of fouls, I would say. Okay. Like early recognition of of of, of fouls that are, you know, maybe. Maybe a little trifling, but but our annoyances. Like I just think about Rocky telling me about heel clips, and, mm -hmm. you know, early in the game. Just making sure you catch that early and deal with it early. Yeah, and the maybe, coach, the coach might know my player is frustrated about that. The coach might be sensitive to that. Yeah, the coach yeah. knows his players. I kept pointing to when I was making this presentation. I always referred to the coach as a he. I don't know why, but he or she, the coach. Um, knows their players. So let's get into the greeting. And I want you to observe. I'm going to play a video for those of you who are playing along at home. This is video number one. And let's see an example. Oh, and this one doesn't have sound, so don't worry if you don't hear anything. Well, Rick's probably telling a joke right now. <laughs> Yeah. 
<laughs> they handled that very well. <laughs> Teamwork. Okay, so tell me what you saw in that greeting, and particularly with respect to the coaches, how they received it, how it all went. Relaxed, um, pie, smile on their faces, all the team there together introducing the, all, all the team introducing themselves to the to the coaching staff and the coaching staff being responsive to that seems like it was a good conversation yeah. okay. do you think the team presented themselves professionally in a way that they would have the coach feel comfortable in their confidence I, I think so because of the way they approached and the way they were all together I mean you know I mean it's important that you Come together as a team and they all they all introduce themselves it seemed like very very professionally sometimes you know you'll have the referee introduce and the, the assistant referees won't participate or they'll be doing something else they were all engaged mm -hmm. okay. i mean that's that's how i saw and they and they seem to be receptive to that all right so this this gives you a good feeling you're starting to create that relationship right now they didn't approach in a way where they were being the the person in charge, they were very friendly, very, but still very professional. I think it looked like the coach's body language showed that they were comfortable with the team and that they were going to be able to work with them. Okay. Yeah. So the next step in creating that relationship is how the player check-in goes. And this is something that a lot of us can really work on and, and try to get better at think, realizing that this is something that some referees encroach on the coach's time with the players and their pre-game <clears throat> so we need to be aware of that as referees that the coach has a plan and so when the referee team approaches they have to keep in mind i'm going to be respectful i'm not going to interrupt the coach i'm going to get there early enough so that i can plan to do this with a little bit of leeway wait for an opening what often works is if you approach and you wait, the coach will notice or the team captain will notice and they will say, hey guys, let's get together for the check-in. Okay? That's much more effective than walking up and blowing hard on your whistle and saying, line up. Okay? Letting them do that themselves is very respectful to them and it lets them realize that you are respectful, that they have things they want to accomplish as well. Um, it's interesting that there's something there too. Sometimes the coach will go, get in a line, get in a line. And then I've seen referees go, no, no, that's okay. That's okay. They like contravene the coach because mm -hmm. they're trying to be more, you know, informed. Hey, it doesn't have to be that, but that's not a good thing. Yeah. You want to let the coach right. be in charge. The coach has been in charge of the players. The players respect the coach. Hopefully they have a good relationship. Let the coach do it how they want. The coach pick what line they want to be on, fine. You adapt to it. Yeah, there was a ref who did, oh, it was me. I did that. <laughs> no, but it's true. I, I'd done that before. And, and and then I realized, you know, the coach is in charge. He's in charge of the players. Let him do, you know, let him organize the players any way he wants. I mean, it doesn't matter to me, really. You know, maybe I'm not that formal. Maybe I don't care. They're all like, he does. Mm -hmm. So I think that's important, and that's a really important point. Let them organize their own players. One thing that I've seen is, you know, now we don't require the players to tuck their shirts in; they're not designed to be tucked in. But some, some coaches, coaches want that. Yeah, and I've seen referees. I've been on referee teams. And referees say, "Oh no, you don't do that." They're again respecting the coach. The coach told right. the players tuck their shirts in, so I'll go along with what the coach wants. We had the opposite at Splash. Where were you on that game? Clint? Yeah, well, it, it was with you, Chris, and I. Well, um, I made this uh, habit in a way to where I at least get the players to look more professional when they put on their when they to have them tuck in their uniforms. If it comes loose, then I let it go during the game times. But at least look professional, look proper for the check-ins and for the coin toss and all. But. So Chris took, I guess, took our ideas based on experience and said, um, said, could you all have your uniforms tucked in? The head coach comes up to us and says, just so you know, I've checked the laws. They don't need to have their uniforms tucked in and all that stuff. But in a, even though he probably meant to say, 
Yeah, there, there, it's no, there's nothing wrong with them, them having the uniforms tucked in. He probably kind of, he came in at like he really wanted to, um, like call shots, even mm -hmm. on a, even on us. So he was kind of like, like crossing a boundary in a, right away. In, well, how did that end? How did you guys handle it? Well, Kristen said, well, I know it's not in the laws, but I want it that way anyway. And, and, you know, the coach ended up taking a good attitude about it, but mm -hmm. I think we had a good talk afterwards. Um, yeah. Well, you know, my approach is just is really not much, especially if you look at 14U in the last tournament of the season. <laughs> There's really not too much you need to tell them there. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of I pushed that agenda. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and even though it isn't in the laws, did you guys know it's the uh... – National rules and regulations, where it has been stated in the so up until recently that the players were required to tuck their shirts in. So those are applied as well. Up until when? Because because I remember I was still enforcing it, mm -hmm. and then I had seen some change in AYSO, and I was like, okay, well, you know, and I think up until then it was not only. It was not only that you had to have your shirt tucked in. I think the law said, if I remember, that it had to stay tucked in. Like for the game, I think I read that, yeah, it had to remain tucked in during the game. And I was like, wow, that's never enforced. And that used to be in the law. Right. That changed a number of years ago. And it was several years after that before right. that statement that's what I thought. the National Rules and Regulations. Yeah. So yeah. Then, then it was always an area where potential conflict but you know it's it's good that the situation worked out but not good that there was a little bit of conflict there um what do you think what do you think the coach is thinking when you're giving a lecture to the team probably uh, similar to what the if it's older players especially probably similar to what the players are thinking <laughs> You're not my dad. Let's, You're not my dad. Can we move on, please? Okay. We want to get moving on. Yeah. Things that I, I've experienced as a coach is um, a lot of times, you, you know, with like 14 new girls, they're just on the group. They kind of understand things. they got some experience. But sometimes I've had, when I'm coaching, I've had referees give a lecture and they're focusing on some topic and then, then the girls are confused and they have questions and the referees think they're being disrespectful by asking questions. But mm. I know that these players really are asking the questions. Right. And so then the referee walks away and then I have to explain to the players uh. what the referee was trying to say and what's important to know and not important to know. And as a coach, I find that very frustrating because now the players' heads are focused on something that it shouldn't be focused on. And they're confused, and they're a little bit frustrated. Um, well, yeah. If the, I mean, I could see that if the referee gives that, and then assumes there's disrespect. That's. I mean, if I have to, if I feel like I need to explain something, and players have questions, I never feel like that's disrespectful. Unless, I mean, and, and even if they're being goofy, it's not disrespectful. Sometimes they ask goofy questions. I don't think it's out of. Uh, uh, I very rarely have seen a player be disrespectful in that regard. Maybe maybe they're having fun or something like that. You. They usually wait yeah. until the first whistle. Yeah, right. Usually it's in the game. That's when it's disrespect starts. Why? But Why? but but it's Why? but when you've explained something and they ask questions, I'm happy to answer those questions. I've experienced I mean, as a coach that the referees have thought it was disrespectful and not wanted to answer the questions, think they're challenging. Um, but I know the person I was, the players that were asking the questions. One example, when I was coaching Mike's son, he loves to ask questions, and he's very earnest in his questions, and he wants to know, because he, he's like detail-oriented. He wants to know the answers. And a couple of instances, the referees took offense to it and thought he was being disrespectful. And, you know, as a coach, I found that frustrating to, yeah, to that's take very... that point of view. Um, well, you've pretty much set the table for your... I mean, that pretty much sets the table for your approach during the game, if that's your approach to a simple question. I mean, that's what I would read from it as a coach. And it's often referees who aren't as experienced, and they feel kind of threatened when they have questions about something. And they think, you know, 
they're trying to show show me up or something like that. So you know, referees have insecurities as well. Um, yeah, I think uh, what I see is referees are they usually start out trying to explain how they're going to call the match, and then right. that just leads into this diatribe about. And then they start getting into other areas in this area, and it's like, enough. You know, it's, I don't think it's the referee's position or job to say much of anything. I, it, it, it can lead you to trouble. When you, when you start to explain to the players and the coach how you're going to call the game, it's a, it's a disaster. And then you tell them how to play. Right. Well, that's the coach's job. Right? Absolutely. That's the, like, and so that leads to questions like, well, if I do this, is it a foul? And then I laugh. Then, then that's usually a. We know what a foul is, right? Okay, we're okay. So <laughs> that's I'm not gonna, you know, is it a foul if I kick somebody? I don't know. What do you think? Like, it's like, like, you know, I guess it would depend. You know, there you can't answer those questions. If those are the goofy questions. But I don't again. Like, are those disrespectful? They're usually goofy questions from from kids who are just want to ask a question or they're, I mean, I don't know. I try to ascribe the best intentions to people before you describe the worst ones. Because often right. referees, they're used to talking about nuances of the law and then and they, they've got something they want to share with the players in the players' case. Like, they huh? have context <laughs> for this and, and their reaction is often confusion. They don't know what's going on. They get distracted. So let's watch an example. Oh, really? Go ahead. So realize there's uh, there's three opportunities, right, to check in with the team. You've got the pet, you've got the coach, right? That's the referee and coach relationship. You have the chance of the referee and the team, and then the referee and the captains. And I just I think the I, I think the point is, and I think you you're, you guys are all saying it. It's appropriate messaging at the time and and the uh, you know with the group that you're talking with. If you spend a long time on it, yeah, it's not appropriate. It's got to be short and sweet, and uh, and there's got to be intent in what you say to each one of those parties. That's well it. Yeah. So let's watch uh, video number two. Let's watch uh, example of a check-in. Keep it simple and straight to the point. Who's that? Who's that guy on the right? Oh, I know. <laughs> well, we're not getting any sound. Yeah, I think it might be this TV. Because I hear birds. Is that the... I usually <laughs> I usually hear sounds, but I think usually the only thing you'll hear is the background of the um, of the people around the camera, and not the people talking over there. <laughs> yeah, what, isn't he from Five Cities or something? Oh, this was still at nail checking time, or was it? It was always the female players with their with long nails. They just love it. My sister loves it. All right. How'd you think that went? Seemed to go quick, <laughs> efficient. Is that good? It seemed like the the group was pretty old to check nails. Yeah, and that that was something that uh, was an obsession that was preached within the region that the referee came from for many years. Right, Keith? Because you were from the same region. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and there's other regions that it was very, you know, to the point of sending players to go get nail clippers. And, I kept know. nail clippers and a little <laughs> bottle of alcohol in my bag so, so they could have them. I did because everybody was like, okay, you don't have any clippers, here you go. And there's some you can clean up. All right. But in general, the referee team was a youth referee team, so that's a little bit of a challenge. Yeah, but they, they look like they interacted well with the coaches and with the players. Players seemed to be kind of curious about the referee. But Seemed like it went very well, efficiently handled, didn't take too long. All right. So now we've created the relationship. Let's work on the things during the game that can help build the relationship. Um, as a coach, persistent offenses are something that can get under the coach's skin and be a flashpoint for them. Um, they can be, often the coach perceives them as unfair and or unsafe for the players. I remember when we talked at the first, what are some of the things the coach wants? So when the coach starts seeing that and they, they think 
if it's targeted on my key player, they think, you know, my player could get hurt. If it's leading to more physical play, they're concerned about the safety of the entire team. And they also might be concerned that they know that one of their players who's persistently being fouled has got the sign sort of a short fuse, and they're setting that player up to go off. So when you start, if you start hearing the coach saying, Ref, come on, that's twice. Ref, come on, that's three times. Same player. Come on, ref. That's the coach is respectfully sort of telling you, I'm concerned about this. I think something bad is going to happen, and I want you to handle it for me. So I like to be in tune as a referee. When I hear a coach saying that, I know that the coach has concerns about the player or the team, and he's trying to express, first, usually first, it's not irresponsible. It's usually done in a respectful manner, but they elevate their voice and they let you know that you need to be paying attention, you need to notice this. So this, I, I think this is a flashpoint for coaches because it threatens them feeling secure. They're worried about the confidence of the referee. So that's, that's one of the key points to keep in mind persistent offenses. We talked about this, I think last year we had a session on about how difficult it is and how to cultivate that awareness of, oh, look, that foul was again, you know, and especially clever teams who target a key player with different players. It's like not only should you be aware of, obviously, the fouls by a player, but who's getting fouled? And that's a tough one. That's like that's a that's a really tough one to remember to log. You know, I know I know Lewis can keep every goal in his head to the second. <laughs> and that's a great skill to that's that's a huge one to work on is oh yeah that foul was against you know 13. That foul was against 13. That foul was again against 13. And at that point, you know maybe there's some not not maybe there's words. Yeah. to the other team's captain or to that player that I'm aware of this situation. And, and, and not even with the players. Even the coaches are getting more. Right. They're getting more and exercise. Yeah. Because for a coach, of course I know that's that's Tim, and he's getting fouled. And I don't know who Tim is. or right. Of course, that's he's our best player. He's getting fouled. He's getting fouled. Ref, God, aren't you seeing it? And you're like, I don't see him fouls. Right? Yeah. right? I'm calling him. Yeah, but it's against him. Like, yeah. but but you don't have that context or that awareness necessarily that, oh, he's that key player on their team. Yeah, I mean, you can tell he's like, or she is that good. You know, they're good player up front or they're whatever. But you have to be. That's a really a a, a skill or a, or a, or a, an, an attribute that you really need to cultivate and really need to to, to learn and fo focus yeah. on. It's a practice. I mean, the way the way I do it is when. I try when when there when a foul occurs, you know, I say, yeah. all right, 14 on seven. And I just kind of repeat it to myself a few times, and then hopefully that helps log it. And I don't do that, and and it's it's caused heartburn for me, and 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 I want to like like I think that particular mechanic uh -huh. is huge for uh, for people, and for me especially, it's something that like I want to focus on on for the next year. That's one of my big. It's like. Because I'll do that. I'll even do uh, though. Like I'll I'll call a foul and I'm doing it. And then who's the foul on? Yeah, who was the foul on? That guy. Yeah. Right. Or or that person. Like I don't even know their number. I didn't log it in my head mentally. And and that's a huge, that's a super important thing to do. And I think it does lend to a lot of of coach frustration. But the good coaches, they'll give you a warning. They'll right. let you know that they've seen it. So don't take that so much as, as um, dissent. If they say, don't say it in a disrespectful manner and you hear it and pick it up, maybe right. try to acknowledge the coach. Coach, I'm going to watch that for you. Thank you. You know, right. Let them know, acknowledge them, and use their help. They pointed it out to you. Now you've got to be aware of it. I'm always like, dang it, I should have caught that first. <laughs> right, right. But don't be resentful when they notice it, because it's their job to notice it. It's one of the things they can they can do during the game. Well, like he said, they know their players. So yeah. They know who's who's taking the hits. Yeah, exactly. 
Another flashpoint for coaches can be advantage. Some coaches understand and appreciate it. Some don't. And it can be a point where if the coach really doesn't understand it, it and if the coach doesn't understand it, then the players may not understand it either. And it may be a bad idea to try and apply it. You have to judge it based on the skills of the players and what's going on. Um, but then be aware sometimes when you award advantage, sometimes when you award advantage, um, got distracted. Cool. and you think it's important to do it, they might not even appreciate it. Right. So adapt your game to what, what's, being, what's happening on the field. Because if it's causing bad feelings, I mean, the whole point of advantage is to allow those, the beautiful nature of the game to continue. But if they don't appreciate it, don't force it on them. And if it's upsetting the players or upsetting the coaches, who is an influencer, it can often upset the players. So try to take that information in and judge and adapt your application. One thing you want to be aware of is if there's a misconduct and you apply advantage, although you can now this year apply advantage on the misconduct, if it's a 100% misconduct situation with the youth, I, I don't recommend that you apply it with the youth. You really have to be careful with that because the coach is probably going to come unglued when they see that. And I recommend with the youth that we really keep in mind that we're there for the safety of the youth. They're not professional players, and we really be, have to be aware, being very careful of the line that you continue on this conduct. I think there's another another component to that too. <laughs> What's obviously the, the understanding of the coach and the players is huge. Sometimes coach, sometimes players don't get it, and and they still play on. And then I'll explain to a player. Hey, I saw that foul, but I gave you advantage. Do you understand that? Yeah, I wanted you to be able to play. You had the ball and you went through. Oh, oh, I get it. Right? They'll be happy, you know. So you tell. But if it's a lopsided game and the losing team is fouled, but they have an advantage and it's not much of it, I mean, they want the foul. They yeah. want it because they feel aggrieved right now. And now you're just heaping pain on them right there. They're down. They just got fouled. My God, you know, call the foul. I mean, that those situations where they're, where they're on edge a little bit, give the foul. I mean, maybe advantage isn't a good thing to play then unless it's just clearly going to be a shot on goal. Uh, one example I can give you, um, when I was refereeing a boys high school JV match, and there was a player who oftentimes you'll find on a JV match, there's a player who just head and shoulders above the others in skill. And this was a situation, this player was very good at ball handling and he'd always want to dribble right through the middle of the defense and he could get through it, he was effective. But he was getting little tugs, little pushes. And so the approach I took is I was very close and as long as he was maintaining possession, still making progress, I was letting him go and I was trying to give him some verbal um, feedback on it. And, um, in one particular instance, I could tell the player was getting a little bit upset, a little bothered, and I was just about to blow my whistle, and then I hear the coach yelling from the side. And the player, he calls out his name, hey, she's giving you advantage. She wants you to play through this. Go ahead and do it. <laughs> yeah, that was great. <clears throat> um, so when you have a coach who understands it and works with the referee on it, it can be very, very good. And actually, the coach came and talked to me at halftime, he said, this player needs to develop, this player's at the level where they need to understand advantage, so keep applying it to this player. So, yeah, I was, I was impressed by that coach. And the player was like, well, okay, coach. <laughs> um, but it, you know, it has to be in the right context. If the coach doesn't appreciate it, it can be difficult because the coach is an influencer. The coach influenced that player to realize that he didn't need me to blow the whistle. He could keep going. I, I I I said that my my thing was from experience. A team down seven to nothing, and it was not going to just get worse. And this 
girl had the ball down in the offensive right in the corner. She jukes the single defender that's in front of her, gets fouled, maintains control, but gets fouled pretty badly. But but the defender's down on the ground. She f- goes through. She's in the area now by herself, one-on-one in the keeper, and then just f- blows the shot, right? I mean, and I had called advantage. I've never gotten so excoriated by a coach in all my life. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, wow, I would have thought one-on-one on the keeper was a good bet. <laughs> you know, yeah. hey, we're losing eight and seven and nine. Just give us a foul. For I mean, he went ballistic. And I'm like, okie doke. Yeah. <laughs> I know how this is going. And so, so you can always please and, and, I, and I, right, you can't always please him, but I remember thinking, yeah, I probably should have just given him. Right, like, like they, she probably didn't have a skill set to. I mean, obviously didn't have a skill set to put that through, and they would have been happy for us to call a foul on this team that was beating them badly. So yeah. I think that sometimes that measuring the temperature of the game that way is a is a good tool to use. All right, let's move on to player management. Here, the coach can be a really big ally for the referee. Um, if you fill in the coach on what's going on, things you see, have a conversation with them, let the coach help you and work together. If you work together, you can work the situation to the advantage of the players. And I, I've got a video here for you, um, video three, and it's really all about the sound. Unfortunately, we don't have sound, so I'm going to play the role of the coach. So when I'm talking during this video, I'll be the coach. I can play the sound from here into the mic. Okay, good. Let's Let me see. know when you want to start. Let's see if I'm. It's got to be this TV because when I practice this with this exact setup, it worked fine. Uh, this is three. Video three, correct? It's gonna be like a. You tell me what this. An is. old Japanese movie. Right. All right, hold on. Oh, that was great. That was gonna work. Oh, you were going? Oh. Go back. Okay. Give me a countdown. I'm ready. Three, two, one. No, 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 So there, the situation, the coach was really helping. He was influencing the team, and the referee let the coach do that and talk to the players to calm them down. Very effective. The coach who can do that is a very good coach. So working together, if you notice the, the referee, I want to play it again. So you can see, he does go and admonish the player who committed the foul. But he waits for the coach to be done with his lecture to his own players to let him finish up. So I'm just going to show you that. Three, two, one. Pretty amazing timing on that synchronization there. Exactly. <laughs> 40, come here. Very good. And uh, let's see another example of where the coach is helping out. So in this next one, let's watch it. Are you with audio on this one? No, it's not critical okay. on this one. You can't hear the coach. So it, the video didn't start quite soon. Let's see, but the, the uh, this player was fouled. The coach called him over to the side. Talking to him, working with him, getting him cool down. Now the situation was going on. So the referee had the patience. The coach had called the player over, let the player go over. The 
coach was giving him some attention, talking to him, put some water on, whatever he wanted, and then let him come back. So the referee didn't intervene and didn't intercede there. He let the coach be in charge of controlling that player. And that's often very effective. Because remember, the coach has a much stronger bond with these players than you do. The coach is used to being their boss, so they can do that. So player management, let the coach get involved. Use the coach. Now, usually during a game, you have to have some conversations with the coach. And the thing that I want to say is most important is respect gets respect. If, if you're frustrated or upset and you go and talk to the coach, it's probably not going to go well. Right now. You have to approach that coach with respect. They want the respect. And they deserve it. Um, it's not always necessary to stop the game. Sometimes you can have quick words with the coach, conversations, building that relationship, just by saying words to them as you're walking by, acknowledging what they were saying, acknowledging what you're seeing, giving them information so they know what you're doing. Um, very useful. Um, if you do have to have a formal conversation, the coach has got a lot of stuff built up and they haven't been able to express it to you probably, or maybe they did a little bit. Let them talk first, always important. Coach needs to be able to say what's bothering them, what they're concerned about. Let them get it out. Don't interrupt them. Let them get it out. And then respond. Um, and if the coach has a valid point, validate it. Let them really appreciate the input. Respect them. Because it's about you guys being working together on the game instead of about the referee imposing their will on the coach. Do coaches ever have valid points? Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and if you ask them, they say they definitely do. They're the only valid point. Yeah. But validating, no. it, it can do great things to build that relationship as soon as you validate something they said. So let's watch some videos here. I think Clint stars in the first one here. Yeah, I know. I remember that one. Oh, wait a minute. Somehow I skipped ahead. Okay, we don't get second. There's cars in both. Is yeah. What do you think of the temper of this conversation? Uh, I think the coach is is uh, upset. Yeah, and, and two different quite. <laughs> Yeah, and, and the referee is catatonic <laughs> in a good way okay but look he walks away yep. he's accepting it he's relaxed he's going to go sit down in no small part because of the demeanor of the referee mm -hmm. so in this case the this. referee has some information to provide to the coach he writes him out explain something to him because the coach is frustrated because the coach doesn't understand and there was a verbal complaint. Now the coach is calm, leaves the field. And watch what the coach does. He's an influencer. He goes over and communicates that information to the parents who are upset. He's an influencer. Use him. Use him as an influencer. We've talked sometimes before about body language and working with the coach. And that, that all has to do with that, approaching them in a respectful manner. But here, I, I, I want to play the one with Victor again. He's very good at quietly imposing his will on this coach. The slow walk we always talk about. Yeah. I think yeah, that's a what big... What you said about Coach, tell me what's going on. So Coach giving him the whole spiel, the whole explanation. Now we sit. No more. And then he gives him some and Now his energy is still a little high, and in the moment he's just going to... All right. Now he's going to relax. Okay, so 
respectful. Yeah. And I think that, I mean, again, I think previously we've talked about this. It's the slow walk over there lets him kind of think about, lets both you as the referee compose yourself and lets the, re lets the coach kind of understand what's go going on, right? Like, okay, he's coming over. We're going to have a conversation and maybe gather his thoughts. And, and, and it gives time for some maybe lowering of tension. Yeah. And then, you know, I think Victor's demeanor is always like, you know, I mean, he doesn't, doesn't confront him. It's, it's really good. All right. Another hot point for coaches, and this gets to one point that he pointed out at the beginning, passing lanes, referees getting into passing lanes. And I was watching the Women's World Cup the other day, and I saw a referee kept getting into passing lanes for one team. And I was wondering, why didn't this referee understand? But being aware of that, the coach will notice, because the coach has come up with some tactics that the team is trying to apply during the match, and the coach knows who's going to run where and, and what kind of passes are going to be made. And if the coach notices the referee interfering with the passing lanes, probably will notice it if more of the players do, the coach is going to get frustrated. Um, if that happens, and if you happen to be in a passing lane and you realize it, if you apologize to the player, or if you hear the coach say, hey, ref, get out of the way, Acknowledge what he's trying to express to you is we're trying to make a run through there and you're in the way. Okay? Learn from what they said and then modify your game. So this is another frustration point, coaches. And they'll communicate to you if they see it. Usually with the higher level games is where you're gonna see this. Has anybody ever experienced this in the game? I think you could safe to say we all do in some cases where we're trying, where the play is being transitioned to where you're supposed to be as a referee. And I do notice that a lot. And sometimes I'm always like, oh, right now I got to really adjust myself so I know where, so, or like check behind me, make sure there's no player or an expected player to make a run. So that way I know I'm not in their way and all that stuff. And sometimes I'm like, okay, I'm going to move this way this time. Mm -hmm. So, it's, it's difficult, and sometimes I often wonder if I'm supposed to, um, if these referees, if, if I'm supposed to, um, like, even listen to, to some of these people, they, like, letting me know, hey, I'm doing something wrong, because in my experience, I usually, I'm usually, like, getting more, ins in my opinion, feeling like I get more insults than more of, like, hey, can you, hey, can you move yourself out of the way a bit so you can um, give us some not interfere, so... Mm -hmm. That's usually what I I don't usually hear the thought food for thought process. I only hear the um, hear the whole just get yeah, hear the whole you're doing terrible. So yeah. with with the changes to the law, this is going to be an even bigger deal now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if they if they get you with the law, they're going to influence play and stop doing it. Yeah, so this, keep that in mind that the coach is noticing this. And if they're sharing the information with you, they're letting you know that you're interfering with their play. Appreciate it and adapt your game. Another way to respect the coach. All right, another area where you as a referee and the coach can build a bond. Fouls in front of the bench. What a beautiful opportunity to build a relationship with the coach. Seize it. As long as it's not trifling, and you can use it in your advantage, do it by yourself, some support. That's a good, yeah, that's a good thing to do. A lot of times they want fouls that aren't. <laughs> okay. So in this video them. right here, we're right in front of the orange team's coach, okay? So let's see what happens. That too, yeah. All right, we don't have the sound the referee blew the whistle. Player went down dramatically, but kind of easy. What did the referee do? Oh, he awarded the foul. Oh, yeah, he has to pull his socks up and throw the ball.
so I think I remember this game too. I, th I think it was a what was it, a club team versus an AYSO team, but the uh, but the people on that bench were actually for the white team, not the orange team. Oh, this is the orange team. It's really hard to see it. Yeah, it was hard to see it. I mean, did it need to be called? Probably. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, it looked good. <laughs> hard to tell what he did. Look at the reaction on the player. Hands yeah. up. He wanted it. Yeah. He's right in front of his coach. Yep. He's putting on a show for his coach. Did it affect the game? They're they're right near midfield there. Right Turned out not to. Right in front of the orange coach. Yeah. Points. Yeah, he's got points. <laughs> Put some money in your pocket and you can pay it out later when the, when the game turns more aggressive or something. So keep in, in mind, thousand points again, great opportunity for you. Ignoring that might have led to the opportunity for the coach to start complaining because everybody's right there. They're an influencer. Yeah. Making the coach happy there, easy way to, to build that relationship. So let's uh, kind of summarize this. Um, I want to talk, uh, this is actually a video from Tom Lippity, a former National Record Administrator. Um, why don't you listen to this? Oh, it's right in this Three, two, one. When the kids go to practice during the week, it is a safe environment. They're with their own teammates. They're with the coach who cares a lot about them. So it's safer to make mistakes. It's safer to try a new thing and not do well. When the game happens, now you have opponents. Now you have the reality of life, trying to compete, trying to do something better than somebody else. So what happens is those kids don't have a high level of technical skill. They might be having a bad day. So if they miss kick the ball a couple of times, or if they score two, three times on them, they will get upset, maybe angry, and you can see it in their faces, in their body language. The coach doesn't capture that right away. The coach is looking at everyone, especially where the play is. The referee has a wonderful opportunity to catch that. So immediately you can say something to the kid like, hey, it's okay, we're just having fun try it again or if needed connect with the coach so the way we do this is before the game starts we are formalizing a process that takes about two minutes all the referees and the coaches come together and agree to take full responsibility for the safety of the kids both physically and emotionally and we're doing the training to make it very user friendly and simple bottom line is about connecting with each other in support of the kids. So, how many times have you, as referees, seen a player who's trying really hard, not being really successful, getting frustrated, and you've given them a positive comment on the field? So, you're kind of acting as that coach type person. Yeah. Do it a lot. Mm -hmm. hey, that's a great play. Good try. Good try. That's a good ball. Really good ball. Keep trying. Keep going. You're doing great. You can get one back. I mean, I constantly talk to the players. Mm -hmm. I try to, especially if they're not having a good day or their team's down. Um, so you're like you're like an extension of the coach there, especially for the youth. The younger they are, the more they need. I think it's 
I think it's just being a fan of the game too. Like a, f- a fan of the game and a fan of the kids. And when you see them do something and maybe it doesn't work out, it's always, it was kind of an extension of being my, a coach. Like I always used to tell my, my parents and players, we're not looking, I mean, yeah, we want results, but we want the execution of what we've worked on. And it might always work out. It doesn't always work out. But when they do something that we worked on in practice, it's a beautiful thing. I mean, it almost brings tears to my eyes because it, it did as a coach. It would be like, that's great. You did the thing we worked on. It didn't work. It's going to work out next time. We're going to keep doing that. It was awesome what you did. You made that run. and did, It didn't get to you, but, man, good job. And, and when you see that with kids out there, it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing. So, yeah, I think you want to give that. So with these kids, you as a referee, you can be an extension of the coach, giving them positive feedback, making the kids feel like a winner. Yeah. And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to be loud. You're just running by them, saying something to them, just a little something. Yeah. And they'll appreciate it often. Okay. So one more topic I wanted to talk about, as we're now going into a big revision to the laws, we now have coach misconduct. And this is way too big to talk about in detail here, but I just wanted to present so you can see enumerated the list of things that Diva has decided constitute coach misconduct. So this gives us some other ways to deal with the coach. Hopefully it doesn't get there, but just to be aware, we have a prescription of what constitutes a warning, what should be caution, and what should be a send-off. So make sure you're aware of these things. It doesn't mean that now we have the power that we no longer try and build that relationship. We're still going to build that relationship, and if we need to, usually we're only going to use um, a warning. The things that constitute a caution are, are definitely something we don't want going on at the game, and we need to ask that they stop. So this is very similar to our ask, tell, dismiss. So the warning is more like the ask. The caution is more like the tell. And the dismiss is is more like the send up. So very specific. Make sure you read this, and then we get to the list of send off items equally as long. I see this as a situation where we're going to have to cooperate to learn, especially in youth soccer this first season. A lot of the coaches aren't going to be aware of this change. Maybe they heard a little bit about it, but they haven't read the list of items. They haven't realized it's going to impact them. A lot of the referees are going to be uncomfortable with this. There's probably going to be some over-application and some under-application of this. Um, with the referees and the coaches are going to be in a learning experience. So um, keep that in mind to have a cooperative learning environment with what's going on with the coaches. They're going to be held accountable with, with parts now. So we want to make sure they understand what's going on. I still think this is a good thing. I didn't think so at first, but I do now in, in thinking about it. Only in the sense that it could present and, and and I don't mean this. I don't mean this to sound as <laughs> as kind of cynical as it does, but I think it's a it's a chance to to provide a learning opportunity for coaching for coaches because I can. I mean, I know me. And I know many many referees that I work with. Whenever they've gone to the brink of sending a coach off, they never write that up. It never gets recorded. And maybe we've talked about this before in a previous thing where somebody will say, I, this, I can tell you this came up in our board meeting. Woo, you had a big, <laughs> this, no. this took over our board meeting between the coach, one of the coach admins, not Derek, but another one. And we just, we've spent 40 minutes on this and how bad it is and how bad it's going to be. But I think it's like, look, division directors have said, oh, uh, somebody will come up to me and go, oh, you know that, you know, Bob, he's terrible. And the, how would I know that? Oh, yeah, he's always a problem out there. Every Saturday, everybody knows. Well, I don't know. Nobody's ever said a word to me about him. 
uh, right? And and because I've never seen any complaints about him, anything formal, it's occasional anecdotal, you know, things, but I don't know that he's a problem. Yeah. Well, this, you know, you get a couple of cautions, maybe that's a, maybe that's a little red flag for you to go, hey, cautions. hey, you know, Bob, I noticed that there's a couple of issues out here and what's going on? I mean, it gives an early warning to maybe somebody um, that, that, hey, maybe there's an issue here that needs to be addressed in a in a positive way early on yeah. before yeah. there's an explosion. It gives referees a mechanism to notify people there's a problem. Before, a lot of referees, like you say, didn't write it up. Some referees would write it up as a note on game card. Right. But then there was no follow-up. Right, no follow-up. And no follow-through with the coach administrator, with the division coordinator to deal with that coach and let them know that, hey, you're on notice, this has been noticed, and it's not acceptable. Correct. So hopefully this is going to be a way to make sure that we do better at making that communication and giving them that early warning. Yeah, and I don't mean, I, and I don't mean that as a punitive thing. I think maybe it's just a, a way to head it off early. Mm -hmm. So maybe. Or maybe. <laughs> it's going to depend on how it's implemented in the right. region. Really it is. And... And I can see it going both ways. The coaches are going to be on edge about it the first time it happens to them. The referees are going to be a little bit uncertain and a little hesitant. And my biggest concern is how it's going to affect the youth referees. Right. Um, but wasn't this specifically put in place to enable to help enable to, them? To eliminate abuse of youth referees, yes. And, but, you know... It takes a lot of courage as a youth it does. To, to show a card to a coach. Has anyone seen this in a World Cup yet? I no. Know. I have actually, you? I've been monitoring every game in the World Cup. I have not yet seen a coach right. get a caution or anything like that. They've been pretty mellow for the most part. Come on, coaches. Don't like that. <laughs> might have had a Where's Mourinho when we had a close one in Cameroon versus England had it escalated even further, but no. Well, thank you. Hopefully thank you. what we talked about this evening will help you build those relationships with the coaches, understanding and an understanding of where they're coming from, what their point of view is. They're totally under your control. They have no power. So use them, help them feel comfortable. And I think the game's going to go better for the kids. Any comment? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Cindy, um, so just uh, I'm actually curious to see uh, your response as well as the kind of the crowd's response to this. So um, one of the things I've learned this year in uh, I do CIF refereeing, and I realize the importance of uh, referees as mentors and uh, maintaining uh, a very strong stance on sportsmanship of the game. And I've noticed that uh, throughout the years and the many games that I've done, we just we we've been loose on the coaching staff in terms of upholding a standard of sportsmanship, and I'm I'm curious to say uh, I've seen these rules come out, and I'm not really worried about it because I know going into a match, it's important to establish that relationship and your boundaries in terms of what's appropriate, and I think I think it's easy for uh, for a referee and a coach to work that together and uphold saying hey you know the reason why we're here is we uphold high sportsmanship, fun, uh, fun, fair, and safe play. And, you know, you can almost set up an agreement with that. And once that's once that contract's laid, then I think you don't even need to go in here other than having a good conversation. Obviously, if a coach goes to an extreme, you, you need to you need to go there. But what do you what do you see in your in your area, Cindy? And then opening up to the crowd, what do you see in the general area of like Camarillo and the teams there? Uh, are the coaches, um, um, do they uphold that sportsmanship? to a high level? Are there always just a few bad actors to where uh, we might have to raise our game in terms of establishing that sportsmanship conduct? What, what would you guys say? Uh, I would, as a coach, I would agree that it, it's known among the coaches and among the referees that there are some bad actors and everybody knows it and people feel powerless to have the situation handled in many cases. And then I can tell you from personal experience that there are situations where uh, a region does step up 
and hold the coaches accountable. And there has been uh, a turnaround in the coaches. So I think it follows that, you know, you got the whole spectrum. The vast majority of coaches are respectful, do not behave inappropriately, and work well with the referees. And a vast number of referees work well with the coaches. I think you have a few on the extreme of both the referees and the coaches that don't uphold the spirit of the game. And, and that leads to trouble. Yeah, I think just what you said, I think the vast majority of <laughs> I mean, you said it, or are there, yeah, no, it's not or, it's, yeah, there's the vast majority does, and there are a few bad actors. But I, but I will say that in area and section, you see the same bad actors continue to have teams year over year over year. And like you said, that then you wonder, this person is a known quantity. They always are a problem. I mean, why do they continue to get teams? Correct. And and that's that's a that's a real it's a real issue. And and, and you know that also I think I don't know if it emboldens or encourages other you know other bad actors as well. So yeah, we have one situation this year with um, boys eighteen U team where a coach had been. Banned from coaching in a region. They had declined to give him a team for, for the previous year. He had coached the year before, he caused trouble. They declined to give him a team. So then he moved to another region where he was an unknown quantity. It's like, great, we have a qualified coach who wants to coach these boys, great. And then right. bad things happened. So. Yeah, in my three years as regional commissioner, um, every year we banned at least two coaches. And, um, and people have tried to work with them, and it just they doesn't work. Improved. Talk to them. They, you know, they're like two different personalities on the field. They're just like a totally different person. And you'll even go to their touchline, and they'll still do it. And um, so we just took a stance and just said, "No, you're done." Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a tough thing. I mean, that's and usually when it gets to that point, the parents are in the same boat. They know it. They can't even control them, and uh, they're usually pretty happy when we do that. Yeah. Have you experienced that? No. Have I? Yeah. Um. I mean, we've all had our our trouble with coaches. Uh. And, you know, there are those referees that, that make it worse. Mm -hmm. I remember watching one game that just always stands out to me where it was right before the uh, the substitution opportunity in the second half. And it was a boys' 19 game. And, you know, the ref called called some foul and on one, one side of the field and then stopped for his subs. And then the player was willing to let it go and was just walking back to, to, to the coach. And the ref followed him all the way across the field and just kept chewing him out until the kid finally reacted. And then he had an issue of misconduct to the kid. And it's kind of like, you know, it's you, you got to realize when when to let it go. The refs need to keep cool heads just as much as, as the coaches do. Um, but, you know, the... I think, I think it's a good point that the coaches are used to being in charge. And when they're powerless in the game, you know, that's, that's, that's frustrating for them. And I've had good success in just pointing that out to them, not in a way to taunt them, but, you know, if it seems like, like, so this particular coach you're talking about, right, that was banned from one region and went to another, what, what ended up working with him was uh, what I've used in other places where we just get to the point where I say, okay, we're, we're not going to be friends today. Uh, so I just walk over, usually it's not my first visit, and I say, look, coach, you're disagreeing with my calls. Uh, and you know my calls aren't changing because of what you're saying. So you have to make a choice here. Uh, are you going to let a bad referee get you in trouble? Or are you going to accept that the game's being called the way it is? No one's getting hurt. Everyone's being safe. You don't like the game being called the way it is. And But I have the power. I have to call it the way I see. 
you can choose to let it go today or you can choose to be in trouble but it's but it's on you and and i've had good response to that because i usually uh am able to project that respectfully and just matter of fact you're not getting anywhere um so your choice without threatening to uh remove them from the game send them off uh you're saying here are the facts you keep digging and you're going to find yourself in a hole or you stop digging and focus on what you can influence yeah but you know it's it's easy to go up with a wall to the coaches uh, where you aren't cultivating the atmosphere that has to be there um, because it's easy to exercise absolute power, power rather than to convince them to see it the way it needs to be, see it the sporting way. And I think, you know, being, being human, you know, acknowledging uh, when they've helped you out, when they've caught something you've missed, that you've made errors, uh, can really help them accept it better. Um, yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank you, Cindy. I hope everyone enjoyed that. Uh, Thank you, Cindy. Yeah. We got a good key takeaway from, from this month is that coaches are people, too. Uh, so keep that in mind. Thank you, everybody.